book of Mark chapter number 14. We have a custom. You might be watching from the desk. Just tell your manager you're stretching. You can stand if you're watching virtually. <laughs> My, 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 my. The book of Mark, chapter number 14, verses probably one through nine. And the word of God reads as thus. This is the NLT version, which is the New Living Translation. It was now two days before the Passover. If you don't realize it, the Passover would technically be this Friday. So two days before the Passover is what? Just today, it's Wednesday. If you're watching this on a loop, this was Wednesday, Easter, two days before Easter, 2023. And the festival of unleavened bread, the leading priest and the teachers of the religious law were still looking for an opportunity to capture Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the Passover celebration, they agreed, or the people might riot. They had to capture Jesus before the Passover, otherwise the people who loved him would have rioted. See, the enemy tries to take you out when you're alone. I'm gonna leave that one. I'll just set that one right there. It has nothing to do with what I'm talking about today. Meanwhile, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, a man who had previously had leprosy. While he was eating, a woman came in with a beautiful alabaster box or joy jar of expensive perfume, spikenard, some texts would say, made from the es essence of spikenard. She broke it or quickly opened it and poured the perfume over his head. Somebody say over his head. Some of those at the table were indignant. Why waste such expensive perfume? They ask. It could have been sold for a year's wages. Some people say $300 or so because at that time they only made about 15 to 17 cents a day. It could have been sold. I guess my mind is wondering, how are you calculating my oil? See, it's only dominating men who want to control women and tell them what to do with what, what they value. I'm sorry, did, I'm, I'm going to get in trouble real soon here. It could have been sold for a year's wages and the money given to the poor. So they scolded her harshly. Verse 6. But Jesus replied, leave her alone. Why criticize her? for doing such a good thing to me. Jesus says it was good. Somebody say it was good. You will always have the poor among you and you can help them whenever you want to, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could and has anointed my body for burial ahead of time. Oh God. This woman is sitting at the table. Well, she comes in. They're sitting at the table. They don't even have a clue or the unction to know that Jesus is leaving. You can tell people, you can warn them, but until it happens to you, they have no idea or until something happens to them. This woman has a prophetic unction to say, now. I don't know who I'm speaking to, but the Lord told me to say, this is your season to break in the room. I'm talking to women. I'm talking to men. This is your season to break in the room with something that you've been carrying for a whole year. I don't know who I'm talking to. I, I hear you. I, I, I just got a download. You've been waiting a whole year to get an opportunity. The Lord tell, told me to tell you that now's the time.
I tell you the truth, I think this is the last verse. Wherever the good news is preached throughout the entire world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. You mean to tell me she did something so important that Jesus says, whenever you preach the gospel, mention her. This no-name woman. They don't even know your name yet, but they need you. They don't even know who you are, but the Lord is calling you. Oh, God, let me stop. This is going to be a different type of message. The Lord told me to tell you that it's your season to use the oil. My, it's, I, I promise that I do a much better job this time. My subject, my title for today is Pour It On Me. Pour it on me. All of it. Not some of it. Not a piece of it. You've been saving. You've been thinking. You've been praying. You've been. I heard the Lord say, pour it on me. Pour it on me. Every drop, every ounce, pour it on me. Father, I ask that you would hide me behind the sacred desk. Allow me to regurgitate and articulate what you have given me in private so the people might be blessed in public. Do what you want to do, Daddy. Throw your weight around. In the invincible name of Jesus, amen. You might be seated in the presence of the Lord. In life, there are a lot of uncertainties you may not be sure who you can talk to, who you can trust, and who to let your guard down to or express your feelings because people are fickle. One day you can trust them and the next day it seems like they're telling your business. Have you ever walked in a room and you're like, man, something seems funny that I talked to her but it seems like they know our conversation so you're not sure who to trust. And typically, you tend to hold things in even when God wants you to get it out because you have no place to lay your head. You, know, you have no safe place to just be honest and true. And I started thinking, I said, well, God, who in the world can we talk to? And the Lord started talking to me about himself. He says, you go to people when you could come to me. You keep thinking that you need to talk to somebody in human flesh, but if you would open up your spirit in prayer, I would allow you to release every burden, every pain, every feeling, every angst, everything you've been holding back. See, God is absolute. When I say that God is absolute, that means he is lacking nothing. No, 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 you, you, you're kind of missing it. When I say that God is absolute, that's a moment for you to understand that he's got all power in his hand. God is omnipotent. That means there's nothing more powerful than who he is. God is omniscient. That means he knows everything. God is omnipresent. That means he's everywhere all the time, at the same time, anytime. There's nowhere you can go without God's power. I mean, this is the same God that said, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, the refuge. In the beginning, the fortress. In the beginning, the rock. In the beginning, Elohim. In the beginning, El Shaddai. El Shaddai. That means he's the many-breasted one. That means he's got so many places for you to drink. There's no need of you being thirsty. I'm talking about God. God is absolute. Why would he need to tell your business? God wants you to come to him because he can handle your secrets. Blame it on the microphone. Oh, God. God is powerful. God is amazing. It's the same God who said, let there be light, 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 light. He says, let there be light on day number one, but he does not create the sun until day number four because he's trying to tell you that he is the light. No wonder when we get to the book of Revelation that there is no sun and no moon because his glory just shines. 
God is absolute. God is omnipresent. When I say that God is omnipresent, that means he's present here and he's also present where you're thinking about right now because you're worried about a certain situation. That means that God is here with you and handling everything that you're worried about. God is absolute. And because God is absolute, it seems like he needs nothing. Why would he need me, this powerful God, this bodacious God, this courageous God, this magnificent God, this marvelous God, this God of wisdom, this God of power, this God of authority. I'm just going to keep talking about God until you get it. This God of the, he is the ancient of days. He's the glory of glories. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's the Lord God almighty. This is the same God where Jeremiah was going to quit. And he said, you know what? I'm done. I'm done. I'm, I'm going I'm, I'm to just sit over here. But it was like fire shut up in his bone. This is the same God who walks with power and authority and fire. He's absolute. And because God is absolute, we assume that he doesn't need us. Because God is absolute, then it begs the question to say, where do I fit in? But the Lord is telling me to tell you that he has need of you because he inhabits the praises of his people. Psalm 22 and 3. If he inhabits the praises of his people, that means you were created to praise and worship him. That means that God gets glory. He takes pleasure in you worshiping him. And sometimes the reason revival does not break out is because we are not really in love with God as much as we are in love with other people and ourselves. Psalm 146 says, I praise the Lord. Psalm 147 says, praise the Lord. Psalm 148 says, praise the Lord. Psalm 149 says, praise the Lord. Psalm 146, let everything that have breath, praise ye the Lord. Praise for the high sound of sympathy. If God is telling us to praise him, that means he gets something out of you opening up your mouth to him. Can we just take a moment and praise the Lord? <laughs> you, no, you, 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 no, 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 you ought to be typing it in the comments. He gave you breath, your feet, your ankles, your liver, your tissue, your bones, your lungs your cerebrum, your cerebellum, your occipital lobe, your throat, your esophagus, your larynx. You ought to be praising for eyesight. You ought to be praising because you can wiggle your toe. You ought to pray because you can jump. You ought to be praising because you can, you ought to be praising for the income that you do have. God is worthy of the praise. God is worthy of it. And he says, until you open your mouth and praise me, you won't understand who I am. Oh God, this is going to be bad, but I think I got a little bit of time. This is why I love reading the book of Psalm. David jumped in and says, Psalm 1, he says, he, he just jumps right in. Y'all remember Psalm 1? Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand the way of sinners, nor sin the seed of the scornful, but his light is in the law of the Lord. And his law that he meditate day and night. I, I, I can't even get it to because I'll get lost. And he shall be like a tree planted. You're wondering why you're unstable, but you're not in love with this word praising him, so therefore you're not the tree. In order to become a tree, you're going to have to start praising God. If you praise the maker of the tree, then the symbolic is you're going to be planted. Psalm 2 says, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Why do, you know, if you keep going down this, on Psalm 2, verse 12, it says, kiss the son. Talk about the S-O-N, lest he be angry. In other words, the text is saying, I don't know why your enemies keep tripping because I'm going to bless you anyway. <laughs> Psalm 3 begins to say, Lord, how would they increase that trouble me? Because God loves a good fight. He loves when everybody's against so he can show off his glory. So he can. Psalm 4 says, give ear to my word. Psalm 5 says, attend to my cry. Psalm 6 says, Lord, don't rebuke me in your anger. He says, you're misreading that. When David is saying, Lord, don't rebuke me in your anger, he doesn't understand what chastisement is because I'm a true father. And a true father... were chasing his son. And so some of you, I, I hear this prophetic, some of you are caught up in situations and you don't like the outcome, but God is chasing you because he loves you. You're busy complaining about what's going on in your life, but it's an opportunity for you to open up and trust God. Psalm 7 says, indeed, will I put my trust. Psalm 8 says, oh Lord, our Lord, how, is this Bible study or not? 
Oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name and all the, who has set thy glory above the heaven? Oh, oh, what is man that thou art my, I, I got to get out. Psalm 9 says, I will praise you with my whole heart. You've been praising him, but it, not with your whole heart. You've been praising him with some of it. Psalm 10 says, why does it seem that you're so far off in times of trouble? Because God says, I'm just looking back and say, that's my girl. That's my boy. Just like Job, have you considered them? I'm going to bless them anyway. Psalm 11 says, in thee who will put my trust. Psalm 12 says, the help, Lord, for the godly man sees it and the faithful fell among the children of men. Because you think that people aren't faithful because you don't see them. But God says, I'm chastising them, bringing their heart, softening it up. And later they will begin to worship me. Never think you're alone. Okay. Psalm 13 says, how long? How? I, this is, I'm. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a word lover. <laughs> I, 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 I'm a word lover. I'm a word lover. Let me tell you something. I grew up in a home where there was alcoholism. I grew up in a home where there was physical and sexual abuse. I grew up in a home where the, my stepfather had a needle in his arm and me and my brother had to help him get a fix every day. So when I talk about falling in love with the word of God, it's the only thing I had. It's what kept us from CPS. It's what kept my mind. It's what kept my heart. It's what kept my body. It's what helped me through school. No, 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 no. Where are the grateful people at? And I heard him calling me one day, blocking me from gunshots. I heard him calling me one day, keeping me from prison. I heard him calling me one day, keeping me from car wrecks. I heard him calling me one day, the disease couldn't stop me. I heard him calling me one day, the trap didn't work. He was calling me, oh God. Y'all not old enough to remember. Pookie on New Jack City, just keep calling me, man. Just keep calling me. I can't just keep calling me. Because God will call you like crack cocaine will call you. God will call you like methamphetamines. God will call you like prescription drugs. God will hunt you down like a jealous lover in the middle of the night. He's calling you. Oh. That's why Psalm, four, that's why Psalm 14 says, the fool have said in his heart that there is no God. Psalm 15 says, who shall join a holy hill? Listen, we find out later he's had clean hands and a pure heart. I said, Lord, how do I keep my hands clean? Because everything you do typically in terms of sin starts with your hands. I know there's a debate to say it starts in your mind, but I can't see that God judges your heart. But typically it's going to manifest in your hand. He said, he who had clean hands and a pure heart. Who have not lifted up thy soul unto vanity? Psalm 16 says, preserve me, O God. Don't you know God will keep you? <laughs> I, I, I promise we're going to, I think we're going to get to the text. God will keep you. Psalm 17 says, hear, hear the aright, O oh God. He says, I, I've tried to walk upright. Hear me, O oh God. Psalm 18 says, you're my fortress, you're my buckler, you're my rock. Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of the Lord. We're praying for all of those who've gone through tornado storms. We're praying for all of those who, the families of those who lost their lives. And we try to do great things through mega care. But I'm going to tell you something. The storms may not stop. They may not stop. And what do you do when the heavens declare the glory? What do you do when it seems like it touched this house and it didn't touch that house? And, and sometimes they call it survivor's guilt and we feel bad because we hear that there are going to be more storms coming. God will keep you in the middle of your storm. God will keep you if you've lost a relative. We're praying strength and comfort and peace over your mind. I'm just talking about the text. I'm just talking about praising God because he's absolute. Are we all on the same page? Psalm 20 says, hear thee, all right. The God of Jacob will hear thee in a day of trouble. Psalm 21 says, the king shall join his holy hill. The king can't be king. The president can't be president because God is the one who placed them in position. Psalm 22, we already talked about Psalm 22. He says he inhabits praise of his people. But David sees the prophetic coming of Jesus Christ. He says, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? If you would get in the spirit, you would, oh God. Can, can, I, can I tell you something? It's just, just, just y'all. If you would get in the spirit, God would show you things to come. If you would get in the spirit, God would prepare your heart and your mind for this next move of transition. Psalm 23 says, the Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in. I, I can't even mess with it because a part of that text says he anointeth. Oh, I'm not lost. He anointeth my head with oil. Because the shepherd's job was to anoint the sheep's head every drop had to go in between the wool because the wool is weighty <laughs> no. 
The reason why he leads the sheep beside still waters is because rushing waters would wet the wool. When the wool gets wet, the sheep gets heavy and it'll drown. I don't know who I'm talking to. You have the right need, you're thirsty for the right thing, but you're drinking it too fast. And the shepherd comes to say, let me take you beside still waters so that they don't weigh you down, overburden your heart. Is that making sense? He anoints the sheep's head with oil because the sheep would stick his head into fences and holes where snakes would be. And the snake's veins would try to bite the sheep. But because of the oil, it would slip back out. <laughs> because of the oil, it would slip out. Because of the oil, it wouldn't stay. Because of the oil, the, the, the ticks and the fly and the flea, it, it couldn't bite. Because of the oil, some of you, you've been in some sticky places, but the oil allowed you to slip back out. <laughs> I don't know who I'm talking to. Can I get some real people? You've done some things you weren't supposed to, but because the oil was on your life, it's the oil. Oh, God, touch somebody and say, it's the oil. It's the oil. It's the oil. It's the oil, baby. It ain't me. It's the oil. It's the oil. It's the oil. Jeez. Dr. Williams, uh, I feel like Easy i I'm getting high off my own supply. So, so Psalm 25. Psalm 24 says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell there. He's, a, he's founded upon the seas, established it upon the flood. What? what? How does God establish and plant things on seas and floods? He says, I'll make you over shaky stuff. So for those of you who've gone through unfortunate situations, things that would have pulled you down, that would have took other people out, he says, that's when I established who I was in your life. Psalm 26 says, judge me according to my integrity. Integrity and holiness is still right. Psalm 26 says, the, the, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my folks came, they said, even my folks say somebody, though it holds you, kept, I won't go there. Because at the end of that, for those of you who feel like you're fatherless and motherless, he says, when my mother and father forsake me, the Lord will take me up. You can trust him because he is absolute. Psalm 28 goes back saying, hey, you're my fortress, you're my rock. Psalm 29 says, worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. It says, the voice of the Lord breaketh the cedars of Kadesh. You must understand that Kadesh was a wilderness. And then there was a portion of God, let me stop. Kadesh was a wilderness, but then on the other side of wilderness, there were big cedar trees. And the voice of the Lord speaks in the midst of a wilderness. You can understand that because there are no trees, but it also speaks in the midst of where there are trees. The voice of God is so strong, it'll come through whatever to come get you. And Psalm 30 says, extol thee, O Lord. Psalm 31 says, I, in thee will I put my trust. Psalm 32, you ought to be shouting right now because it blesses he whose transgressions is forgiven, whose sins are covered. Psalm 33 says, I will rejoice in thee, O Lord. Psalm 34 says, I will bless the Lord at, and his praise shall be in my, my soul shall make her, the humble shall hear, and be, O oh, magnify the Lord, and let us exalt his name for." Psalm 35 says, if I'm facing a court battle, plead my cause. Psalm 36 says, Lord, don't rebuke me. Don't, don't, don't chase me with your anger. Psalm 37 says, fret not thyself because of evildoers. He says, stop worrying about the people who are doing wrong. They're going to soon be cut down like the green, like, they will be cut down like the grass and with it like the green herb. Psalm 38 begins to talk about the passion and the mercy and the power of God. And when you get to Psalm 39, he says, I'm not going to sin with my mouth. A few more sons and sons and, I, and I'll be done. Psalm 39 says, he says, I made a commandment that I wasn't going to sin with my mouth. And some of you don't trust the absolute power of God because your mouth keeps getting you in trouble. Our mouth can be used to praise. Our mouth can be used to sing. Our mouth can be used to pray. Our mouth can be used to edify, to build up. Why is it this tongue that keeps tearing down things that we say we want to build up? Psalm 40 says, I waited patiently for the Lord. Psalm 41 says, in thee will I trust. And I'll stop at Psalm 42 because Psalm 42 says, as the deer or the heart pants after the water books, <sighs> my soul will pant after thee. The deer would go up and down the mountain. 
looking for something to drink. Some 40 to 60 pounds skipping up and down like a young row. And the issue is, this is God showing me that sometimes we go up and down the ladder of corporate success. We go up and down the ladder of relationships. We go up and down the ladder of finding out who we are and what we're supposed to do. We go up and down the ladder. Can I retire? We go up and down the ladder. And he says, I'll give you drink. There's a difference between praise and worship. Thus far, I've really been talking about praise. Praise says, God, thank you for my shoes. Thank you for my watch. Thank you for my wife. Thank you for my clothes. Thank you for my heart. Thank you for my mind. But worship says, if I don't have any clothes, I'll worship you anyway. If I don't have a car, I'll lay prostrate. If I don't have a husband, if I don't have a wife, I'll worship you. The absoluteness of God would make you think that God is good all by himself. But the Lord says he created you to have not only power and dominion, but to praise and worship him with everything you've got. No wonder the Lord would lead us to the book of Mark. These 14,949 words wrapped into 16 chapters. Mark's quick book is different than the 28 chapters of Matthew because Matthew says so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so because Matthew is speaking to the Jews because the Jews were concerned with lineage. In other words, where are you from? Where are your mom and them from? Because they rank you according to hierarchy. Luke's 24 chapters are a bit different because Luke's 26,000 plus words are talking about description and this is why Luke uses more things about women than anybody on the planet because Luke was very descriptive of what was happening. And then Mark's, Mark's 16 chapters are not as strong as the book of John. The book of John's 21 chapters are completely different because John is speaking to everybody. Luke's book speaks to the Greeks because they were concerned with mentality, the mindset. But John speaks to everybody. This is why John 3 and 16, 3, 16 says, for God so loved the that he gave his own begotten son because John is concerned with everybody. But Mark is straight to the point. Mark uses words like straightway and immediately some 40 plus times. And when we get to Mark, is this Bible study? Are we okay? Y'all, y'all, you can take notes. You can watch the kid. And when we get to the book of Mark, what's happened is we stepped into an interruption of John the Baptist's thought and his love with God. I wish I had more time. In the garden, we, you remember that Adam and Eve sinned. And you remember that they were covered with the coats of skin. This means that an innocent animal had to die. But we were not sure what kind of animal it was until Exodus chapter number 12. Because God tells Moses, I need you to get a spotless lamb without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. So in the garden, we found out that an innocent animal had to die. In the book of Moses, we find out that the animal is a lamb. And then we don't know what to do with the animal's blood. And then God said, I need you to apply the blood on the doorposts and the lentils. Can you see them applying the blood on the doorposts horizontally and the lentils vertically. I, I just wonder what that was trying to do on the doorposts horizontally connects like a cross on the lentils. And before we fell in love with this Moses who was saying, hey, this is a lamb. Isaiah said, he was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities. Wait a minute. Is it an animal? Is it a lamb? Or is it a man? So Isaiah tells us that this must be a man. Are you with me so far? I love it. I see my note takers. Yeah, yeah. So we know it's a man, but we don't know which man until Mark chapter number one. And John the Baptist points him out and said, Behold the spotless Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Mark chapter number two, we find out that there were four men who had a paralytic friend. The man was paralyzed, so he had four friends who cared about him, but they only had one problem. They're trying to get him to Jesus. There was no room. There was no room. So they went up, the, they scaled the wall and tore open the roof to get the man to Jesus. You ought to have some friends that are willing to get you to Jesus. You ought to have some friends who are willing to take you to the hospital. You ought to have some friends who are willing to pray you through. You ought to have some friends who say, you know what, you're better than that. You ought to have some friends who say, you know what, I'm going to confront you because you're wrong. 
Mark chapter number three, we come across a man. I'm just going to work it up. We're we, we going to be in Mark. Y'all okay? Just, just eat some popcorn. We okay? When we get to Mark chapter number three, we find out that there's a man with a withered arm. And Jesus heals him on the Sabbath. Jesus looked around and said, stretch forth your hand. And I was praying. I said, God, why did you, why'd you have Jesus heal the man with a withered arm? And the Lord began to speak to me and says, it's time for you to stretch out on faith. It's time for you to stretch out on everything that the enemy tried to get you to shrink back on. That's the issue. People want you to shrink back, and when you stand forward, they get jealous. People want you to cower down and dummy down yourself, but the issue is God is telling you to stretch forth. Touch everybody you can reach and say, stretch forth. When we get to Mark 4, something interesting happens. We see that Jesus is now speaking about the mustard seed. He's saying, if you have the faith of just a grain of a mustard seed, you can do mighty and powerful things. For those who just join in, feel free to sow whatever offering you like, but it is not the amount of your seed as much as it is the power of your seed and the belief of your mindset. When we get to Mark chapter number five, this is what we find out. It's the woman with the issue of blood. <laughs> Bishop preaches this like, no other so this is bible so i can't i can't even touch it but i will say this <laughs> this woman was healed by the hem of his garment the hem wasn't on his head the hem was at the bottom and some of you are missing blessings because you're going for the top but the real anointing is at the bottom the real anointing is at the bottom the bottom was a collection of all the oil that the top couldn't keep. The bottom was the place, it was a collector, it was the foundation, it was a catalyst, it was a substrate. It's the bottom. If you're in a bottom situation, God told me he's getting ready to raise you up. When you're at the bottom, that's when there's an anointing. When you're at the bottom, that's when you understand that God is absolute, but he still needs my praise. When you're at the bottom, he'll raise you up. Everybody's going to the top. But if you humble yourself, then he would exalt you. Mark chapter number six, we find out that Jesus is walking on water. <laughs> he, he becomes the first man to, to break a world record. How's he walking on water? He's, can you imagine Jesus walking on top of, I'm not saying this in the text, I'm just, just thinking, walking on top of stingrays and sharks and on the crest and on the wall. He's just walking, just bypassing seaweed, getting a fresh a pedicure. Jesus is walking on water. And I said, God, what it was. God, I said, I only have so much time. They're going to sit me down. I got to get to Mark 14. He said, but you need to tell my people that they're going to walk on top of things that pulled other people down. They're going to walk on top of things that tried to drag them. They're going to walk on top of things that other people would have died in. You are a water walker. <laughs> Where are the water walkers? Can, can the water walkers make some noise? Where the water walkers praise them? My finger, he teaches my hands to do war. Water walking also starts with the keys. Water walking can start with a microphone. Water walking can start with a pen. Water walking can, can open up with you doing a podcast. Water walking can open up with you doing hair and doing... Ah, where are my water walkers? Water walking can be engineering. Water walking can be sales. Water walking can be marketing. Water walking... When we get to Mark chapter number seven, we see that the Seraphonician woman... <laughs> She's, she figures out a way around. She's a smart woman. She says, listen, my daughter has an unclean spirit. Somebody say unclean. Unclean, unclean typically means demonic. So I, I, I just caught this. I, I got to give 30 seconds to this. Some of you have walked in your house. You said, mm, something ain't right. You ever walked in your children's room? You said, mm, they into something, something. Something ain't right. You ever walked in and said, mm, what are they Googling on their phone? What, 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 what's my child listening to? Because you walk into a room and you say, that's an unclean spirit. This mother says, my daughter has an unclean spirit. She says, Jesus, I need you to heal her. Remember, she's a Seraphonician woman. And Jesus says, hold up. I'm sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. It's not meat for me to give the, 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 meat from the, the children's meat to the dogs. She said, but even the dogs can eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. She says, let me tell you something. I'll take what your disciples waste. I'll take every crumb. I'll take every piece. I'll take every crack. I, because there's chemistry in the crumbs. That means that the same thing that's in the slice is in the hole. That means the same thing that's in the crumb is in the slice. She said, I just need a little bit. They wasted what they got. If you give me a little bit, if you give me one opportunity, if you give me one shot, if you give me one chance, 
you better be ready when your opportunity comes because it, I'm talking to a people who don't need a whole lot. You just need one chance, one chance to manage, one chance to open a business, one chance to meet him, one chance to meet her, one chance. In Mark chapter number eight, they're in a pickle. They've been following Jesus for hours. These people are hungry. He says, what you got, baby? Normally the text would say two fish and five loaves of bread, but this particular text says a few fish and a few loaves of bread. Whatever it is, go get it. Because the master, sometimes he adds by subtracting. He subtracted from the little boy, but he added to the people. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, uh. See, sometimes your deficit is somebody's multiplication. This is why you have to be willing to sow a seed. Mark chapter number nine, there's a deaf and a dumb man. When we get to the deaf and the dumb man, we see that Jesus, he's healing because Jesus walks in the power and the authority of his father. And the interesting thing about the deaf and the dumb man is that God never really heals the same way the same time. Sometimes he, he would spit in people's eyes. Sometimes he would spit in the ground, mix it with sand or mud, make an eyeball, and then make them see. Sometimes he'd lay hands two or three times, or he said, let me, he said, I lay hands once. How, what do you see? I see men walking as trees. He said, let me lay hands again. Now I see them walking clearly. Sometimes you need a second touch. And Mark chapter number 10, as I hasten to where I really need to be, we're finding that blind Bartimaeus is crying out because he's blind. He's by the highway side begging. He says, thou son of David, have mercy upon me. Thou son, it's like saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy upon me. They told him to be quiet. Whenever people tell you to stop praising God, that's when you know you're close. Oh, yeah, I, 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 yeah, this, this. <sighs> you're going to push me. I'm going to push you. Let me say something. Whenever they tell you to stop, that's when you ought to start. Whenever they tell you that's enough, you ought to keep going. Whenever they say quit, you ought to say, oh, no, that's my season. It's your season when you know that you've given everything you can give, that you could give, and the enemy's trying to say, stop, just quit. It's never going to happen. But God will provide an opportunity. And when we get to Mark chapter number 11, as I study Bishop's sermon, last Sunday was Palm Sunday. Okay, and, and Bishop, like he does, murders the text. I mean murdered in the most eloquent way. <laughs> it's what we say in our colloquialism. He did a phenomenal job. It was auspiciously, exuberantly, ostentatiously amazing. It was anointed. And Bishop talked about holding patterns because this is where the coat was tied up thinking that it was in a holding pattern when really it was just reserved. <laughs> Bishop messed me up. I'm in the car crying, shouting, because some of you are on hold in certain areas in your life, but you don't realize that God has reserved you. In other words, there are things that are passing you by for a reason. They don't even deserve your worth. And this odd couple on Palm Sunday, which would have been a few days ago, because the donkey has never had anyone sit on it before. And some of you, nobody's, been ever, nobody's ever been able to tame, but God will tame you. No, 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 I know you're tough, but God will tame you. My flesh, his spirit. My wretchedness, his righteousness. That was Palm Sunday. <laughs> I've just given as a point of reference. When you get to Mark chapter number 12, and we're almost where we need to be, because I think it's a worship moment for what he's really been giving me. Mark chapter number 12, Jesus has set his face like flint to the cross. And if you're like me, and if you're my staff in here, don't say anything. When you got something to do, hey, let's go. Hey, what, what, what's up? What, did you send an email? Did you call me? Because we got something to do. 
He doesn't have time to waste. He comes in the temple and he says, my house should have been called a house of prayer. You're in here gambling? What, what, what are y'all doing? Y'all selling? What, what are you doing? Merchandise? He flips over tables. Jesus is frustrated. Jesus is so mad. Be angry and sin not. I'm, just saying, I'm not saying that he sinned. He's so angry. He curses the fig tree. Die. I'm like, Jesus, what's up with the fig tree, bro? Because Jesus says this fig tree has leaves on it but no fruit. He's saying, I hate the spirit of deception. I hate it when people want to look good, but they're broke. I hate it when men want to invite women out, and that's not really what they really want. Um, I hate it when she acts like you're her only lover. I, It's in the text. It's in the text. He curses the fig tree in chapter number 12. Chapter number 13, they go back by, and the disciples see that the fig tree is dead. Like, it's withered. Like, whoa, it really worked. <laughs> this guy really moves mountains with his mouth. And when we get to Mark chapter number 14, I try to take as much time as possible because this is Bible study. I would love to just preach and shout, but I want to make sure that there's an impartation of truth and scripture memorization so that you fall in love with your Bible. When we get to Mark chapter number 14, they are at Simon the leper's house. Now, scholars typically disagreed on this. Some scholars believe that this was Simon the leper and he used to have leprosy, and possibly Jesus healed him. And other scholars say it didn't even matter because wherever Jesus came to sit at somebody's house, no disease could stay. I'm not sure. They are in Bethany on the edge of the Mount of Olives. Bethany means the house of figs, thus the fig tree. Jesus tells the fig tree, how can you chill out <laughs> and grow with leaves with no fruit in a place where you're supposed to be fruitful, but you don't have any fruit? Bethany is the house of figs, but also the house of affliction. It is the house of olives. In Bethany, for my Bible scholars here, Bethany is the place where a particular type of olive trees grow in barren regions. And it's a conundrum because they're trying to figure out how do, the, how, does these, how do these olive trees actually grow when there's really not a lot of rain in certain parts of Bethany and certain aspects because it's the Mount of Olives. And the interesting thing when you study it is that these olive trees have roots that go deep beneath the surface. When there's no rain above them, they go deep enough to find water underneath them. You've been looking for the wrong kind of blessing. You just think it's the people who have titles and positions and who are above you. But the Lord said, if you would go deeper in your circle, deeper in the exposure that I have given you, deeper in your mindset, deeper in your ideas, deeper in your books, deeper in what I'm trying to do in you, you wouldn't just look for it above, you would search deep beneath. And because these olive trees have roots that go down deep, they are sustained. And because they go down deep, there arose a mount of olives because all of these olive trees are plentiful in Bethany. And when we get to Simon the leper's house, the Bible says they're sitting at meat. Jesus is sitting down chilling according to the best possibility. I don't see Dr. James. Dr. James would normally give me a thumbs up or thumb down. So I'll, I'll take a whooping later. I think Jesus is sitting at the table and they are about to eat, whether it's lunch, whether it's dinner, and it's the custom and they're eating. And typically no women were allowed at the table. Sisters, what's up with that? Because you're living in a misogynic society. Actually, today, women still only make 85 cents to the dollars. Brothers, we got to take responsibility and do better. 
I should have heard the men shout. And this misogynistic society, the men are at the table, particularly most people also think disciples as well. And let me make sure you fully understand this. This is a Wednesday. Palm Sunday was on Sunday. On the Mondays when he cursed the fig tree and turned over the tables. On the Tuesday is when he went back and saw that the fig tree withered up and died. On this Wednesday is when he's at the house of Simon the leper. And they're eating. And this woman just breaks in. And she begins to anoint his head with oil. I think I've gotten almost every drop out of this thing. It's going to be like one last drop coming down. Come on if you're coming, drop. Come on if you're coming. And the reason I had to wait on this one drop is because this woman had to wait for everything that she had saved up for the perfect opportunity to meet the master. And this is why some of you can't give up. And this is why I hear, I hear God saying, pour it on me. Because she tried to pour this oil into other vessels. <laughs> Exhibit A, you will see that this was a vessel, but this vessel is too small. This vessel could fit on the inside of this vessel. This vessel wasn't enough. I don't know who I'm talking to, but the people you've been around, they couldn't handle you. You think you're not married because you weren't enough, but maybe it's because you were too much. You think you broke up because she got with another guy, but you don't realize that you were a real husband and you had more intelligence and depth and business and prosperity. You had more power to give than she could actually hold. I'm just, I, I don't want to add anything in the text, but perhaps the woman looked for other vessels to fill and she could not find it. And then some vessels, I'm like, why is this vessel so much smaller than this one? Because some things look nice, cute, and neat. And they work for a season, but in the end, you're not fulfilled. Now, if you only think I'm talking about a flask of oil, then you need prayer. Because some things are nice and neat and clean and cute, but they cannot handle the weight of who you are. Could it be possible that you have boxed yourself out because of God's absoluteness? You, you bought into the concept that God is absolute, and I believe that he is. I believe that's actually truth. But because God is so grand, you see yourself so small because you don't actually understand that he wants to partner with you. And if I'm going to do my assignment right, if we can show this on the screen, I have a brief illustration beyond the flask to give you a clearer picture of the protocol in which she broke. You don't come up in that day to a bunch of men while they're eating. Exhibit A. If you can see my screen here, this is the high priest in the Old Testament. The high priest had to come in with the miter on the head, head had to be covered, come in with the onyx stones, Interesting enough, let's pause for a moment. The alabaster jar, when you study it, was marble. The woman kept this in a precious place with a precious stone. If you look at my screen here, you will find that the high priest had a miter on the head. The high priest has onyx stones that six on each side representing the tribes of Israel. The high priest had the the, the breastplate of righteousness. We've been talking about it. Pastor Joel ripped it to shreds. Uh, Pastor Sarah then came and tag team with that because we see that there are 12 tribes written. There are the stones. Underneath the, the vest, you'll see Urim and Thummim. You ever heard of Urim and Thummim? The Urim and Thummim are the stones we believe that would light up when they would ask God, should we go in, should we go not? 
And you will see now the girdle. Then you would see the ephod, which covered the body. Then you would see the pot of incense, which meant that the priest had to come in praying and singing and praising and worship. Oh, I'm not lost. That's why we went through Psalms, because the priest is coming in in the posture of worship. And then you will see that the robe is blue. Blue typically represents grace in Scripture, gold for his divinity and his kingship. Then you will see that the white linen represents purity. This high priest would go into the tabernacle. You did know that this is Bible said, and I was going to take it a little deeper, right? But because you might not remember the, ty the tabernacle, exhibit BA. <laughs> Team, if you can put my next slide up. I want to show you something on the tabernacle. Let's back it up a moment. Let's back up the red, if possible. Back up one more time. Let's go again. When we get to the second slide, when you can see the tabernacle, if we can go to the second slide, team. You were on the right one. There we go. Perfect. Typically, this has been fast forwarded a bit because I wanted to show you, I don't have much time, but there are deep teachings on the tabernacle. The priest had to kill an animal at the brazen altar. You see the first box, that's the brazen altar. The brazen altar represented salvation. Then it, the priest would go and wash his hands the, in the brazen labor. That's the outer court because the outer court is daylight. But then the priest will go in the inner court. The inner court is candlelight. That's why when you go in to your left are the golden candlesticks. You ever seen this before? Now is it making sense to you? And to the right you see the table of showbread. He is the light of the world. You remember Jesus says this in the book of Mark. He is the bread of life. He also says this in the book of Mark. And if you go a little bit further, that is the that box there is covered up by the red uh, cross. It is the altar of incense. That's the inner court. The outer court is daylight. The inner court is candlelight. And then the most holy of holies is the last portion. You tracking with me so far? Raise your hand if you're tracking with me. Type it in the comments. Say tabernacle in the comments. Say I'm tracking with Okay, we're good? We're good? The most holy of holies was where the Ark of the Covenant resided. This is where the power and the glory of God was. Not just anyone could run up on that Ark of the Covenant. Oh, you're going to die, baby. It possessed three things. Aaron's rod that budded. That means that God can take a dead thing and make it bud. No wonder Jesus was so passionate about the fig tree having leaves but actually being dead. He said, because if you're really alive, you would have produced fruit. Because Jesus takes dead things and makes them live. It would also have the Ten Commandments. It would also have the pot of manna which sustained the Israelites in the Old Testament. I know it seems a little heavy. Just stay with me so far. This priest had to walk up all these steps to get to the back to the Ark of the Covenant. But this woman just walked right in and started dumping perfume on Jesus' head. What are you doing? So some of it wasn't about misogyny. They were trying to say, what are you doing? You just don't walk up on the master. What are you doing walking up on Jesus? What's wrong with you, girl? Where's your husband? How much this cost? Do you have a ministry to the poor? What are you doing? Please give me my last slide, Exhibit C. This last slide gives you just a clear depiction of what just happened. It is the outer court, it is the inner court, and it is the most holy of holies. The outer court you will see is the body. The inner court represents the soul. That's your mind, your will, your emotions. The, the last portion, the most holy of holies, that represents your spirit. This lady went straight from body into spirit. You missed it. This is what I'm trying to tell you about praise and worship. She went from her body, her trouble, her situation, her saving all this oil, bringing up all this cost. She said, I'm going to just go right on into the spirit because I know who he is. See, you've been wasting Jesus. You're sitting at the table with him, and you don't even know who he is. That's my master. Oh, God, he's Adonai. Oh, this is the king of kings. This is the Lord. This is the glory. This is the great I am, and you're missing it. This is what she was saying. She goes from sonship, past fellowship, to worship. And the Lord told me to tell you, pour it on me. Nobody else can handle it. They couldn't handle it back here. I know they couldn't handle your value. They couldn't handle your self-worth. But if you would keep on walking, baby, 
from the body through the soul to the spirit. If you get to the spirit, I can handle every trouble. I can handle every pain. I can handle every disappointment. I can handle it. I know they told you because they, they couldn't handle it. I know you broke their heart because they couldn't handle you, but I can handle you. Oh God. Oh God. Oh God. This is a worship moment because God is saying, pour it on me. Pour it on me. Open up your heart. Pour it on me. I can handle it, baby. Pour it on me. Tell me what's really on your mind. Pour it on me. Tell me how you really feel. Pour it on me. Tell me what you're really thinking. Pour it on me. Pour it, pour it, pour it. No, 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 no. I need you to pour, pour, pour until there's nothing left on the inside. I need you to pour, pour, pour. The reason she had to pour is because this, this right here is temporary. <laughs> you miss Because this is temporary, you don't understand that everything that comes on the inside of you doesn't have to stay. You can take it to him. <laughs> Am I saying this right? Y'all help me out. I'm trying to tell you that every trouble and every pain has to be poured back into the master. I didn't even see this drop before. You remember I had the last drop, but there's another drop. And I don't know who I'm talking to, the Lord said, there's more in you. There's more in you. He says, I can handle it, baby. There's more in you. I can handle every ounce. I can handle the childhood trauma. I can handle the molestation. I can handle the rejection. I can handle the pain. I can handle the mental illness. I can handle the fact that you still smoke. I can handle it. Oh, God. Oh, I don't know who I'm talking to. I heard the Lord say, I can handle it. God can handle it. I'm, I'm, listen, I, I, I know what's in my gut. Some of you are struggling, and this is not medical marijuana. You are struggling with marijuana. You are struggling with co crack cocaine. You are struggling with methamphetamines. You are struggling. Some of you are struggling with porn. You are struggling, and the Lord told me to tell you, he can handle it. He can handle it. I know you, because you, you, here's what you do. You've been hiding it from everybody else. You were hiding it because these vessels couldn't, they couldn't hold it. These vessels, they, 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 they couldn't hold it. They couldn't hold it, baby. These vessels could not hold it. And the Lord told me to tell you to pour it on me. Pour it on me, baby. I know you can't trust it. Pour it on me. Pour it on me. I'm going to tell you a quick testimony. I think it's a testimony. It's in progress. Because sometimes we tell testimonies and then it's still not done yet. Bishop, call me. And I said, yes, sir. And we were texting. And he said, for the, he said if it's the last thing I do, I'm going to get you to talk. Bishop said, is there something I did? What's, what, what's, what's wrong? Talk. We, we don't, we're not talking like we used to do. Is it because you, you're working? What, what, what is it? I said, no, I'm good, sir. Bishop said, you can talk to me. What's really going on, Ben Shard? You know, Bishop, talk to me, son. I just want you to be your best, full, highest self. He said, everybody needs somebody to talk to. I didn't realize that I went from the parking lot to the pulpit holding secret pain. How was it? I don't trust. What? Do I not trust Bishop? Like, no, yes, sir, I trust you. I'm so used to handling things on my own, sir. I made all kinds of excuses. Sir, you're busy. You're saving the world. You're writing books. You do. He said, talk to me. And I don't know who I'm speaking to, but God's going to send somebody that you can trust. He's going to send somebody who can handle the oil that you carry.